be seated. Please turn in your Bibles to Exodus 34, verse 5. We have uh, some Bibles up front, and men who, if you don't have a Bible, just raise your hand. They would love to put one in your hand. This is the point in our service where we take the Lord's Supper together, communion. And again, we'll be looking at Exodus 34, verse 5. If you're using one of those Bibles that the men are passing out, that's on page 67 in the front, page 67. In this passage, Yahweh, God himself, reveals himself to Moses in a pretty extraordinary way. And this passage impacts the rest of Scripture as the writers who follow pick up this same language that God reveals himself with in these following verses. Let's read. You can follow along as I read, starting in Exodus 34, verse 5. The Lord, Yahweh, descended in the cloud and stood with him there and proclaimed the name of Yahweh. Yahweh passed before him and proclaimed, Yahweh, Yahweh, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, but who will by no means clear visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children and the children's children to the third and the fourth generation. And Moses quickly bowed his head toward the earth and worshiped. The phrase we'll be focusing on for our time as we seek to remember the Lord and proclaim his death together is found at the beginning of verse 7, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. This passage reveals God's thorough pardon and forgiveness, as well as God's glorious prerequisites to forgiveness. God's glorious pardon or thorough pardon in forgiveness and God's glorious prerequisites to forgiveness. First, God's thorough pardon in forgiveness. That phrase that we find in verse 7, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. This uses three different terms, iniquity, transgression, and sin, that all describe some type of wrongdoing that is contrary to what God is required, contrary to God's law and contrary to God's character. These three different phrases, these three words are not intended to give you three clear, clean-cut categories by which we can put all of our wrongdoing into here I've done iniquity oh, and there I've done transgression or now I've thought of sin. But rather these three phrases, if you trace them throughout the Old Testament, what they do is really cover every type of wrongdoing against God from the accidental mistake that you might make that was contrary to God's law, like what the the priests might do as they were making sacrifices those unintentional sins if they had messed up the procedure. It covers those types of wrongdoings that need forgiveness all the way through the high-handed, rebellion, treacherous sins against God like David's sin with Bathsheba. And so what's really being communicated here is that God is the type of God who will pardon and not hold guilty all types of sinners, sinners who have sinned all types of sins from inadvertent mistakes all the way to high-handed rebellion. And so we see that God first is thoroughly forgiving in his pardon. But what type of God would be able to so thoroughly, fully, eternally pardon sinners like us Look at the first description that God gives of himself, starting 
in verse 6. As he passes before Moses, he proclaims that he is this type of God, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. That's in the ESV translation. If you're looking at the NASB, um, some of those terms differ a little bit. But these attributes are what qualify God to be so thoroughly forgiving. The first thing that we see is that he says he is merciful. A merciful person, God or people, must be a merciful person who is having compassion, who has pity on the one who has incurred guilt before God. And that is what God is. He is merciful inherently. God is also gracious. He has a nature where he is kind and willing, even eager, to show kindness to the wrongdoer who has offended him, even though they don't deserve that kindness from him. He is merciful and gracious. And also to be thoroughly forgiving, one must take more pleasure in withholding displays of his wrath, his anger, than actually being quick to show those. And that is what it means for God to be slow to anger. He is patient in such a way that he yearns to restrain wrath long before he displays it against the evildoer. In these final two phrases that really become a manifestation uh, or from which his thorough forgiveness flows primarily is his steadfast love, his loving kindness, or faithfulness, or truth. And what these two phrases together just mean is God is loyal and committed in his affection for those whom he has determined to show it. Consider that when God chose in eternity past to show a love in salvation to those whom he chose, no one was there to hold God accountable. And so God is faithful to himself primarily when he sets his love on an individual. When no one was there to hold God accountable to make sure that he would be faithful to actually set his love on those whom he had chosen to save them, God is still faithful to himself in his own commitment. God is steadfast. He is loyal in his loving kindness. And his truth, his faithfulness, means that he is consistent with his own character. What good would these other attributes be? What good would a merciful God be? What good would a gracious God be? What good would a God be who is slow to anger, who is even loyal in his love, who's not also faithful, who on any given day might change his mind and say, you know what, I am a gracious God, I am a merciful God, but today I'd just rather not be that. He is faithful to be all of these other things. And all of these qualities were most clearly displayed at the cross, what we remember now. When Jesus, who had lived a perfect life and did not deserve God's wrath, he was the only one who didn't need God to be slow to anger toward him. He went to the cross and in a matter of hours absorbed the furious wrath against all of the wrongdoing that those who believe deserve. All of these qualities are most clearly displayed in those moments that Christ died for sinners, that Christ rose so that sinners might experience the thorough, complete, eternal forgiveness of God. And that is what we remember now. Those who continue to live a life of rebellion against God, those who continue to insist that they don't need forgiveness as thorough as God says he forgives, as thorough as God says that we need, this time is not for those people. If you find yourself having that attitude today, this time simply is not for you, not yet. 
one must embrace that they are as thoroughly sinful as they are, as God says they are, before they can receive the thorough forgiveness that God has for sinners. And so if you find yourself still rejecting, still clinging to salvation by some other means outside of Christ or your own goodness and Christ can make up what is lacking, it's not what the Bible teaches. And we would just ask that when the bread and juice come by that you would just pass it and not take. But consider these words that if God must be so thoroughly forgiving, then that means that you must be that thoroughly sinful. I'd love to talk to you if you have questions. Uh, anyone you've seen up front is able to explain this good news to you. But Christian, if, if you do believe in Jesus, you are trusting him completely for your salvation. You've acknowledged that your sin requires this type of forgiveness from God. Then now as you consider even the ways that you sin, the iniquity, the transgression, the sin that you've committed this week, rejoice that God has so thoroughly forgiven you in Christ. And when communion comes to you, you can take on your own. Men, please come serve us.